Is it that? In, if anybody has something, but if y'all see something and you don't understand, or I'm talking too fast, or can't understand me, tell me to slow down, or whatever. So, these are always fun for me for to do these with with patients and whoever, and just uh, I find I have some interesting questions. And if you have questions that aren't even on the topic, we'll go there too if we can. So, but uh, but this talk is really um, what we decided to do is on stress testing and then some of the different kind of stresses and who needs them and some of the different kinds to give y'all some ideas. And I know some of y'all have been down the road of having a few stress tests, so we'll kind of give you an idea of why we pick certain kinds and stuff like that. So, but that being said, let's get going here. So, first, you know, kind of generic place is who needs a stress test? You know, why do we do stress tests on people? And a lot of the times if somebody comes into to us, our office, and they're referred to us for chest pain, anywhere and sometimes that can be in the back it can be your shoulder blades in your front of your chest and your armpits but any kind of chest pain and you know there are certain classifications of chest pain that we may be a little more suspicious about than others but you know a lot of times the the primary care doctor sent them to us and let us do that um, shortness of breath some people never have chest pain you know people say well I don't have a heart problems I don't have any chest pain but they're very short of breath just walk into a mailbox or something like that and that may be all they ever get so um, you know that's another reason a lot of times when patients want to start an exercise program <laughs> we'll stress them before that or anybody even with or without a heart problem in the past if you have a heart problem, you hadn't had a stress test in a couple of years, you're doing fine, but before getting on a vigorous type of exercise program, we may want to stress you to make sure you're doing okay. Um, and even patients, you know, usually somebody's in their 50s or 60s, now if it's 30 or 40 years old, we may not stress them before stre starting an exercise program, but once you start hitting 50, 60, 70, if you're going to do something pretty vigorous, we may stress you before. Um, Periodically, not every year, I wouldn't say, but periodically, uh, when we see patients with heart problems and they're on medicines, we do a stress test to make sure that they're doing okay on medicines, make sure that their medicines are actually taking care of their symptoms and they haven't progressed subtly, that their medicines may have kind of kept them from feeling. So we use stress tests for that. And then the last point here is, a lot of times we have our colleagues call us, the surgeons, the orthopedics, the general surgeons, you know, any kind of surgery. And if you're going to have gallbladder out or, um, and it's becoming even more and more, cataracts, even stuff that's very simple, we think, but sometimes they get a little nervous when patients have heart trouble and some of the different medicines. Nowadays, there's so many different medicines that our heart patients are on blood thinners and all kinds of things, and they want to know, is it okay if I do this surgery on, on this patient? So we may do a stress test sometimes we may not but um, but that's one of the things we do um, for that what's the goal of the stress test? what are we trying to figure out really just to see if your heart's okay your heart's just a pump and it has blood supply just like a motor almost and if it has enough gas it does fine if it has enough blood supply with oxygen it should do okay that's what the stress test is looking for you know the word ischemia that first word on the second line there that's the term that the heart's not happy, it's not getting enough oxygen or blood supply, and you may present with chest pain or shortness of breath, or when we're doing a stress test, we may see changes on the electrocardiogram. That's the little stickers they put on your chest and the little printout. Um, and then again, for somebody without heart disease and they just come to us with shortness of breath or chest pain, we wanna say, you know, do they maybe have a problem that we haven't figured out before? The type of stress tests that we do really fall under two kind of stress tests and the second one's a little bit, I'll get into it first in a, in a second, really just kind of a walking treadmill. For somebody who has a normal electrocardiogram, doesn't have a lot of problems medically, hip problems, knee problems, you know, that they can walk on a treadmill and their EKG looks okay, we may just do a plain walking treadmill. Well, there's a lot of folks that we see that for various reasons they don't have a normal electrocardiogram hip problems knee problems you know they can't walk on a treadmill lung problems we do imaging stress test and I'll get into that a little further and those either involve an echo or some radionuclide imaging that allows us to do 
a little bit different kind of stress test, and those are a little bit more sensitive, and, and we'll get into those in a second. So, walk and treadmill, just a plain walking stress test, okay? You're going to be walking on a treadmill. Ultimately, you know, you may be running a little bit, you know. It's not, it's not like you're going to be jogging for very long because everybody, especially some of the younger folks, we say, well, I'll go 15, 20 minutes on the treadmill. Well, we don't have a whole lot of hills here in Louisiana, and once that treadmill starts cranking up, they kind of get tired pretty quick, so they don't go as far as they think they're going to go. But we're wa we usually are watching, you know, obviously watching your heart rate, watching your blood pressure and your pulse rate, things like that. Um, at certain intervals, usually every three minutes, that treadmill increases in speed and it starts going up. Most of the treadmills, and then nowadays they got some fancy ones, you see the Pelotons and all that stuff that they advertise on TV, but you know, not too long ago, most of the treadmills wouldn't go past a 10 degree incline, like when you go to the fitness centers and stuff. We start stress test at 10 degrees and go from there. So we're already cranked up past where most of the treadmills go. So it gets a little interesting. We're looking for certain targets when we do a stress test. We want your heart rate to get 85% of an age-based heart rate. And that age-based is basically taking the number 220 minus your age, and we want you to get to about 85% of that to say it's a good stress test. You know, if we have somebody only walk for a minute and they say, well, I'm tired, I'm short of breath, or I'm, I don't want to go anymore, and their heart rate only gets up to, say, 100, well, they need to get up to 130 or 140, well, that doesn't tell me much. It didn't, didn't really stress them very much. So we have to get a certain amount of time and get your heart rate up, and there are some criteria that you can look at from different, they have, a Duke, Duke has set up a criteria that we look at heart rate and time on the treadmill, and there's certain criteria that gives us a risk assessment of, you know, is this a good stress test or not? You know, did you have some EKG changes? Did your pulse rate get up enough? There's things that we look for to say whether it's good or not. Sometimes people, and especially, you know, people that we take care of are on medicines for treat heart disease. And well, those medicines a lot of times prevent their heart rate from getting up. Well, we know that and that's okay. And we may be just looking to see other things, blood pressure and how they respond and EKG changes. Sometimes if we don't know if you have um, heart trouble yet, we may tell patients to hold certain medicines the morning of the stress test so they can actually get their heart rate up. The things that we're looking for if they're abnormal, obviously the EKG part, that's, what, that's the mainstay of the stress test. We look for certain changes on the electrocardiogram. Um, sometimes may develop an abnormal rhythm that's not quite as, as sensitive as, as the changes, and certainly we'll look for blood pressure changes and pulse rates and things like that. The stress test, you know, you can see on the bottom here, it's about 60% sensitive and its specificity is 70, 79. You know, what do those numbers mean? It basically means, you know, it's a good test. You can miss some people, so I'm always pretty particular about telling patients, in a, you know, if, if they only go a very short time or barely got their heart rate to target, they only went maybe two or three minutes or four, just kind of barely got where I want them to say, you know, this is a good test, but if your symptoms that you came to as far persist, don't ignore it. It's not like this is a carte blanche saying, well, I passed my stress test, obviously I can't have a heart problem because we do miss some stuff with stress test. So it's a good test, it's a good entry level test, but it isn't perfect. Um, imaging stress test, um, that's for people, number one, that we want a little bit more sensitive of a test, or for some reason they can't walk on a treadmill, so we have to do some other kind of testing. Now that will involve pictures that we take both at rest and when we exercise them. And it usually either involves an echo machine, and an echo is like they do for the ultrasound, just like they do for babies, echocardiogram and ultrasound, same terminology. We look at the heart, we look at it before, and we look at it after. Or we can give medicines that are radioactive that have a tendency to go to the heart. That's where the affinity for them is, and we take pictures of the heart before and after. And it's targeted for the heart. Stress echo, exercise stress echo. Very popular, I use this a lot. I really like this test. Um, a couple of things, you know, it, it's good, it's quick. 
Sometimes we can do them. It, you can do it in an office setting. We don't do it in ours per se, but it can be. Um, usually it's an outpatient thing we do in the hospital only because we don't do it in the office, but it's, you could. Um, it's just a time restraint thing that we don't do it. Um, it tells us, not only does it tell us are we looking for problems with the blood flow to the heart, it tells us function because we're actually looking at the heart, watching it squeeze and things like that to see, you know, see if you've had any damage before or, or if your heart's strong or not strong. Sometimes we can see uh, when we're watching the heart because when we're exercising people for them, we give them a medicine to make their heart go fast. Sometimes we can see the heart start not working well before we see changes on the EKG. And that's, you know, basically if you think about it, when people come to us and they're having symptoms, they may start feeling a lot of things, shortness of breath or chest pain, and even if they had an EKG on them, we may not see them when they come to the emergency room. We only see heart attacks sometimes. We don't see, if you had chest pain 30 minutes ago and it went away, your EKG is going to look normal. Well, I mean, that may happen when we're stretching in the beginning. Well, if your heart's not happy, it may start getting a little sluggish, and we can see that even sometimes before your EKG changes. So it's a very good test. Um, we do try, if we can, to use a treadmill. Um, and, and, you know, again, this test, sometimes I was saying, was used for people who can't walk. But if we want a little more sensitive of a test, we'll use this test. If they can't walk on a treadmill, we we'll use a bike sometimes or even medicines to get their heart rate again to that 85% um, target rate. Um, when we do walk on the treadmill, it's a little bit cumbersome for somebody, you know, and again, a lot of times we'll use chemicals to make your heart exercise and go fast because you have to walk on the treadmill if you're able and that's kind of reproducing the natural thing that you're doing around your house or outside or whatever. We stop the treadmill right very quickly and you get on a stretcher real quick while your heart rate's going real fast and we look at the, <laughs> at the pictures before and after and we compare the two and we see how did it look before and how did it look after. And if all the arteries are open, you see the heart squeezing real well, it moves well everywhere. Well, if part of the arteries are narrowed or obstructed and it can't get a good blood supply, that area starts getting a little sluggish and it doesn't move well. Just like a bear who hibernates in the winter, it starts slowing its metabolism. Well, your heart does the same thing. If it can't keep up because of no blood supply, uh, it gets a little sluggish. And when we compare the two, we can see that there's a problem, and that makes us you know, say, okay, something's going on here. We've got to pursue this further. Well, if you look at the bottom here, you see these numbers again. I'm not always liking to throw numbers, but it kind of gives you an idea. This is about 70 to 85 percent sensitive and specific, you know, upper 70s to almost 90 and again this is about as good as we get you know in the 80s usually as I mean, I'll tell people 85 percent most of the time pretty good test we pick up most of the problems if there is a problem with this kind of test don't miss too much you can but it's not very often if you if you got a good picture of the heart sometimes people have lung issues or you just can't see the heart real well with an ultrasound sometimes just the way God made you sometimes for certain people, you just don't have a, a window that that ultrasound can see real well. But that being said, if you can see a good picture, it's a pretty good test and we don't miss much, but there are a few. Again, this is one of the dobutamine stress echoes. If you can't walk, this is a medicine we can give you. It's one of the medicines that makes your heart race. That's what it's designed to do. We use it in other areas of, of cardiology when people come in with heart failure and they have a very weak heart, we may give them a low dose of this medicine to help treat heart failure in the hospital. But for stress testing purposes, we're given a lot, a whole lot more than in the hospital. And it makes your heart go to that 130, 140, 150, wherever we want it to go. People feel a little anxious when it because, you know, it's one thing when you're walking or exercising and get, making your heart rate go up. It's another thing to be sitting there and all of a sudden your heart rate's going 150 by medicine. It makes you feel a little jittery. It's not uncomfortable, but people, we usually have to talk to them and say, okay, this is a normal sensation. Don't get nervous or anything like that. It goes away very quickly when we stop the medicines. Um, I like this a lot. Um, number one, the biggest thing from my perspective is, and you can imagine when, 
when you walk on a treadmill and you stop, your heart rate comes down pretty quick. That's a normal reaction. So the technician who's trying to take pictures doesn't have a whole lot of time to get pictures after you exercise. When I use this chemical stress test, they could sit there all day if they wanted to. As long as you're feeling comfortable, they can take a, a little bit more time getting good pictures when your heart's under stress to make sure there's no issues. So this is something I go to pretty frequently. <laughs> if there's any issues to me that somebody can't walk, hip, knees, ankles, whatever, lung disease, then I'm very comfortable doing a test like this because it gives us a lot of information, very easy, don't have to fast like some of the other tests that we do in heart, for heart trouble, you know, very easy and very quick. And again, you know, maybe a little bit more sensitive than a regular stress test because I can stay there longer, the heart rate stays up, I can take my time taking pictures and things like that and specificity since it's, I'm taking a little bit more extra time. The other kind of stress test that we do, and I know a lot of y'all have had these kind of things, is a myocardial perfusion stress test. Nuclear stress testing is another term we talk about. <laughs> Thallium stress test, technetium, those are some of the names of the pharmaceutical drugs that we use. And that's, you know, the difference between a stress echo, this is a, a chemical that's going to go, it's a radioactive agent that goes to your heart, and we're going to take pictures of your heart before and exercise, before and after. We can either do it again walking on the treadmill, or we can use that dibutamine, uh, whatever we need to do to get your heart rate up. And there are actually some, some chemicals that we use that don't really stress your heart, it's based on a physiology of dilating arteries. A little bit more difficult to explain, but it's just a flow phenomenon. If you have a big pipe, a lot of blood's going through that. If you got a little pipe, not too much is going down the little one because if it's blocked, it's not gonna get as much blood. And so it's a discrepancy in flow and it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't stress the heart and allows us to see if there's limitation in flow to the heart. So there's several ways we can do that um, the nuclear stress test, again, tells us if, if you're having trouble, that ischemia, not a happy heart, or if you've had infarctions, it tells us if you've had st stuff like that. Um, again, done with exercise or with the drugs. Um, again, before and after, we take pictures before, and if you've ever had these stress tests, you kind of lay it on a table, a camera goes around your chest like that, and you, you're doing pictures before, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes and then we do some type of either stress testing to the heart or give you that chemical that dilates your arteries, give you some more of the radioactive tracer and take pictures after. So we, and we compare the two images. Um, again, images before and once heart rate achieved are with the pharmacology that we give you to dilate the arteries. Very sensitive tests, very similar to the dibutamine stress echo in the 80s and you know close to 90. Very good test, we've done these for years. The biggest thing that, you know, from a patient standpoint, you have to be NPO, um, no caffeine. There's, a, there's some medicines that lung doctors use called theophylline. Um, not too much as, as they used to use before, but they still use it pretty frequently. That medicine interferes with the medicine we use for the stress test, so if, you've, if patients who are taking that <coughs> medicine, we can't use this test on them, or we tell them that they have to hold it for 72 hours. Not too often somebody says, well, I didn't know I couldn't drink coffee. And caffeine also interferes with the test. So we have to make sure they don't have any coffee or food or anything like that. Because if you, we like them to have to be, not eat after midnight, because if you eat, your gut has a lot of activity and it, it's, your stomach starts getting a lot more blood supply to help digest. and it, it just deters from the test. It, it, it takes up a little bit of that tracer, so it obscures the heart sometimes. What, if, about, what if factors help me decide? You know, we talked about regular stress tests. We talked about the dibutamine stress echo or the regular stress echo or the, the nuclear stress. How do you decide which ones we want to do? Um, size plays a difference. Somebody who's rather heavy you know, sometimes that can affect our ability to either see a good echo or even um, heavy chested women can sometimes, the nuclear stress test, because you're going through tissue, it just affects the images sometimes. EKG can make a choice. 
There's certain EKGs that I have up here, left bundle, branch block, or pacemaker, or heart block. There's certain changes on your EKG that I can't see if you're walking on a treadmill or if I'm stressing you. If your heart's in trouble, the EKG will not tell me that, so I can't rely on that. And I don't want to have to wait till you're having chest pain or you're in trouble. You know, if I'm seeing on the images with echo, I want to be able to see on EKG or know if I have to stop. So there's certain EKGs that I'll say, nah, we can't do this kind of exercise test, stress test. We have to do the chemical stress test where you don't walk. Um, inability to exercise, that's probably the biggest one we run into, you know, joint pain, joint problems, back, knees, anything like that. Certainly lung trouble, you know, if you can't exercise because you can't breathe well or if you got bad lungs, you're not going to exercise, so that limits what we can do. And people with heart disease already, if you've got blocked arteries or say you've had bypass surgery, a regular stress test is not going to tell me much. You know, I know that you've got blockages. I know you've had bypass surgery. You've had stents. I need something a little more sensitive to make sure that your heart's doing okay at the time. So I'm going to want something that has additional images, be that echo or the nuclear pictures. Somebody with severe hypertension, if they're not controlled, we certainly don't want to put them on a treadmill because every time you exercise each stage, your blood pressure normally is going to go up 10 or 15 points. So if you come into the office with a blood pressure of 140 and you go on the treadmill for six to nine minutes, you may get your blood pressure to 180, 200. Well, that's normal when you exercise. It comes right back down. There's a certain elevation in blood pressure as you exercise that we're okay with. But when you start up there, and that's not a good idea for us to put you on a treadmill or something like that. And then depend on how bad your blood pressure is, we may not be able to stop certain medicines to be able to do a stress test. So those are some things to take into account. Heart failure patients, obviously, you know, if you've had congestive heart failure, how much can we push them? You know, can they exercise a lot or, you know, can we push them that much? Some valvular disease, one of the things that we look for is aortic stenosis. That's one of the main valves that comes out of the heart. Uh, the blood pumps through and pumps the blood everywhere. It's the main valve out of the left side of the heart. When that valve starts getting tight, that's pretty severe, and I'm trying to push your heart to pump blood through a straw, well, it doesn't get real happy, and we know that you're going to get in trouble if it's bad. Now, if it's just mild or moderate and not real severe, then we can stress those. And every once in a while, we actually use a stress test to see how somebody's doing who has severe AR stenosis, but that's very uncommon and you know that's one where we're in the room right next to the treadmill and ready to stop it immediately. So pericarditis and myocarditis, those are inflammations of the heart. Pericarditis is like an inflammation around the heart. Your heart sits in a sack and it beats every time. Just like all your joints have a little fluid to allow them to move, your heart has ever so little fluid allows it to move. Well, sometimes that fluid can get irritating and it can make your EKG have some changes. Doesn't mean you're you know, gonna get in trouble, but it just has some changes on your EKG. Myocarditis is sometimes just like any muscle. If you sore and you work out or you tear, you hurt one muscle, your heart's a muscle and it can get inflamed from a virus or things like that. You certainly would want, not want to stress it or put it under, you know, a load when it's inflamed from some type of, you know, viral illness or some other issues that make it have myocarditis. Females are a little bit more precarious than men. Um, number one, they usually have non-obstructive disease more than men. What does that mean? Men will usually have more severe, 80, 90 percent blockage versus 50, 60 percent blockage. So that may make me want to do something a little more sensitive that could pick something up a little lower in severity than the 80 or 90 percent blockage. And women usually have more single vessel disease than men. Um, and sometimes again just, you know, breast artifact and things like that that we run into with women that we don't obviously have with men. Side effects. Everybody always working, well, am I going to get in trouble walking on the treadmill? Can't say that I've ever had one. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you do enough stuff, things happen, unfortunately, in medicine. Now, the, the, the worst thing that can happen is you have a heart attack. Now, again, 
never had that happen, but it's theoretically possible if you've got a problem and I'm stressing your heart, it's not happy, you could get in trouble. I guess you know, the only consoling thing is if you're going to get in trouble, I guess you'd want to have it in my office versus somewhere else. So, um, Rhythm issues, arrhythmia, sometimes people can develop abnormal rhythms, atrial fibrillation or an irregular rhythm on the top of their heart. It's pretty rare to have an irregular rhythm from the bottom. Sometimes people get extra beats on the top, top or the bottom of the heart that come out. And usually when your heart rate starts going faster, that's actually less likely. A lot of times it will happen in recovery when your heart's slowing back down or something like that. And that's, you know, pretty infrequent. Low blood pressure and feeling dizzy. Um, after you exercise, your blood pressure is going to come down to normal. Sometimes it actually goes a little lower. You've got a lot of, when you're walking on the treadmill or something like that, your, your thighs or, whatever, or your calves are having a little more blood supply than normal. So your blood pressure may drop a little bit, usually not excessive or anything like that feeling dizzy, and both of those things can occur sometimes with the medicines we give. So sometimes they feel a little dizzy, you know, <coughs> jitteriness is not uncommon with the medicine we use, the dibutamine that we stress people's hearts with. So that's probably the most common. And shortness of breath, a lot of times people feel a little winded with the medicine we use to dilate the arteries for the stress test. Um, it does dilate. It makes people feel breathless. The half-life of the medicine is about six seconds. So once I stop the medicine for the test, it's really gone in about 30, 45 seconds from, you know, from out of your system. So pretty, pretty, um, you know, quick. So that's pretty much the overview that I had, you know, and I'm happy to answer questions for anybody on stress testing or whatever. <laughs>